you've got your traditions and so do we. And if you're a guest with us, we're glad that you've made part of uh, your tradition this year to worship with us and to celebrate our newborn king uh, and our risen savior, Jesus. One of our traditions here at Chapel Street is that every year in the Advent season, the four weeks leading up to Christmas, we focus on something called Serve the World. Serve the World is our way of talking about how our collective generosity and prayer can make a greater difference together than it could apart. And we tell you stories about people doing remarkable ministry locally and around the world and encourage you to pray for them and if God moves in your heart to be generous to them. Last week we talked about, uh, uh, you saw Becky's story from Naomi's house. A radical story of transformation in this incredible ministry. Tonight, we want to show you Corey's story. Not in my words, but in his words. Let's watch Corey's story together. I was taken from my parents when I was young, in and out of foster shelters, homes, different parents, feeling like Nobody wanted me. I just have been through so much and I've carried so much anger towards myself. I would say when I first started drinking alcohol, I was in high school. I had a best friend at the time that was a few years older, so he was going to bars. I have an older brother who's three years older than me and we look similar, so <laughs> of course I took his ID and I was able to get in to places with my older friend and we would drink and of course I didn't think it was anything wrong with it, you know? It's been part of my life, a part of what, how I coped, how I had fun, just what was a part of me. I've heard so many times, oh, you need to stop and you need to stop and I know now it was just to hide the pain, but it caused so much pain for others. The 18th of April is when I started my official journey at Wayside. Coming here, hearing different stories out of the Bible. I mean, I've never really read the Bible. Be only in church did I hear these stories or hear verses out of Mark, Luke, whatever. It was that month after. It was just I started listening and started hearing what they were saying, and I just would get something inside me it's like man and of course i start crying i'm like i could resonate with these stories let me just think about him all the time let me just let this work right at that time i think something just clicked I'd be like you know what i need to change and again like i said i knew him but i didn't know that i had to give him everything and when I surrendered, I remember the day in the shower, I just said, dear Lord, I'm tired of being a screw up. I'm tired of the pain. And I dropped to my knees and I said, just help me, whatever it is. I used to look at the cross and know that he died on the cross for us, but now it's not the same. I know what he went through. I can't look at a cross and not see him carrying it and seeing him being whooped and battered and bruised and still pushing through everything for us, for me, and them just saying he could be your father and knowing I didn't have a father growing up that was there for me. And I said to myself, I could replace him. He could do all this for me. Let me try this. Let me give him my all. And I did. Next is Corey Viola. Corey! That's a good one. Corey, share a little bit with us, my brother. Pour your heart out. First of all, <laughs> Glory to the number one God, God Almighty. Amen. But as a lot of you've heard, I love the Lord. Amen. And that's what they've allowed me to do, have a relationship with him. Because I knew him, but I have a relationship with him now. 
I'm sure you all know of him, but do you know what he can do for you? My advice is to the guys behind me, just give it over to him. Just being able to give this story, I know it's going to touch someone, and I think that's why I'm doing what I'm, what I'm doing. I know he, he's gonna put me in a place to be an inspiration to others. I love what they've provided for me, and they allowed me to get that relationship with my Heavenly Father that I wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. I've let the Lord change my life, and it's for the better. And I thank Wayside in that fact that they fed me the food that I needed, which was Christ. I know Corey. I get to spend some time at Wayside Cross in Aurora once a month, and, I, and he's, a, he's a hero to me. His courage and his faith are an inspiration to me. I hope you get to meet him someday. We tell you that story because Wayside Cross Ministries uh, is one of our partners. So that's one story of life change from one of our partners. Partners are those other ministries that we as a church family across all four of our campuses support through prayer and generosity. And we give to them so they can do what God's called them to do. And we get to be part of that through our generosity and prayer. And we have a goal through our Advent season uh, over these next the, the four weeks, the three weeks leading up to this week and this weekend to raise $300,000, all to give away in the new year to ministries like Wayside Cross and many others. We've been telling you their stories. Now, some of you are here because you're here with family and friends. Maybe you're here looking for a place to worship this Christmas. I'm so, I'm so glad you chose to worship with us. Feel no pressure or obligation to, to give. We're just glad that you're here. But if God moves in your heart, and you want to contribute, uh, all you have to do is write serve the world uh, in your check or online. And all that money, we keep none of it. We give it away to ministries like uh, Wayside Cross and others to see what God would do. And then we get to celebrate in the new year and tell you the stories about what God is doing. So uh, again, thank you again for your generosity. Those of you who do pray and have given, you're making a difference in lives like Corey's. Let's pray. Father, we pause and acknowledge that even though our cultural season's about buying and receiving. We recognize that at its heart, the Christmas message is about your radical generosity to the world and the gift of your son. And we see it changing lives, Corey's life and our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your great gift. Open our eyes and our minds and our hearts now as we spend some time in your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Christmas is almost here. I know you know that. Some of you are like, oh, who's ready for Christmas and excited? Yeah? It's always the young ones. Yes, right there in the front row, excited. Some of us, if we're honest, we're just trying to get through this season. I was driving here for the last service earlier today, uh, the previous service, excuse me, up Randall Road, and there's so many cars. And I thought of the wisdom of Proverbs. The fool is the one who shops on Saturday, December 23rd. No, that's it, yeah. There's so much to do, people rushing around buying things and getting it all done. And maybe you feel like that. I, I sometimes feel like that. Like, we've got a lot to do. There's things to bake and to cook and people to get into town and make sure they have arrangements and buy and wrap and write cards and services to plan. And then you're just trying to get through it. By the 26th, you're like, whew, we made it. But what a shame if that's all it is. So in the moments we have, just a few moments, just want to take some time and focus in on what, what we're really doing here. What is it that we're celebrating? We sing these songs, we do these things, and our traditions are wonderful. Uh, I mentioned my son coming home last night. Um, it, uh, after midnight, he's in our kitchen eating peppermint bark that my wife makes every year. It felt like, okay, this is right. Things are right now. I remember one of our traditions was she would send the boys out to the garage to smash peppermints with a hammer. Every boy's little dream. So she could make peppermint bark. Now we just buy the ground up peppermints already, but maybe you have your tra traditions as well. And they're good as far as they go. And you've chosen to make this part of it. And I know you know the story. Maybe you know it from Luke chapter 2, right? Or if you don't know Luke 2, you know the Charlie Brown Christmas special? When Charlie, well, somebody tell me the real meaning of Christmas. And who answers him? Anybody know? Linus. And he quotes from Luke chapter 2 in the King James Version about the shepherds. And lo, there were shepherds keeping, shepherds keeping watch over their field, flocks by night. And he quotes the story as the real meaning of Christmas. I want to share with you one verse tonight. One verse. It's not from Luke 2. It's from John chapter 1. One verse that I think captures the real heart, not just of Christmas, 
but of what it is we believe as followers of Jesus. What it is we really celebrate that's different from our cultural celebrations. Come from John chapter 1, verse 14. You'll see it here on the screens. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The meaning, the purpose, the heart of the gospel and Christmas in a single verse. There's a lot of words in there. Word, flesh, dwelt, glory, grace, truth. We could spend hours on each word. They're they're like pregnant with meaning. But I just want to look at just two words. Just two words from one verse tonight. The words flesh and glory. Flesh and glory. I'm going to guess that flesh is not part of your regular vocabulary. How often do you use that word? How about glory? Glory. How often do you use that word? More still, how often do you use those words together in a sentence? How often do you talk about flesh and glory? They just don't go together in our minds, let alone our vocabulary. These words are they're, they're essence of what we celebrate, though, what John is saying to us. The Greek word for flesh is sarx. It means, uh, you know, your flesh, this physical flesh that you inhabit. Or uh, the, the Latin word is carne. Anybody ever had carne asada? right? It's a, it means meat. Uh, so you live in a meat suit, so to speak, right? In, in, in the flesh, your flesh. Uh, and we don't think about, what does that have to do with glory? Who's ever been in a slaughterhouse? Anybody? You ever watch how meat is processed? Do you ever walk out and go, that was glorious. That's kind of gross. What in the world does flesh have to do with glory? How do those go together? We read that the word and if you've been in a part of the series, we've been looking at the first 14 verses of John. The word is the word logos in Greek. It means like the, the principle behind the whole universe. Became flesh. The God of the universe who made and sustains everything took on flesh and dwelt among us. I think this is a strange idea. Christians believe strange things on the face of it. It's strange first because of the vulnerability. The infant mortality rate in ancient first century Rome, the Roman world in which Jesus was born, was over 33%. That means a a baby had a one in three chance of making it to their first birthday in that part of the world at that time. It's risky, this thing we call the incarnation, to take on flesh. Human infants are among the most helpless creatures of of all mammal, of all life. A, A newborn colt? It comes out of the, uh, is born from its mother and it can stand within 10 minutes and can walk within an hour and run within two hours. Now, I know you moms think your kids are exceptional, but how many of your kids came out, could walk in 10 minutes, stand in 10 minutes and walk in an hour? No, it's like a year. They're so helpless, human babies. Can't stand up, can't roll over, can't lift their own head, can't feed ourselves. Totally weak, totally vulnerable, totally dependent. And John says that's glorious, that the God of the universe became that, the weakest, most vulnerable, helpless. And second reason is it's the believability of this. Who is going to believe that the creator of all that exists will become a helpless human baby? That sounds ridiculous. I mean, it, it sounds strange, doesn't it? I mean, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, pagan mythologies, world religions are full of stories of gods appearing as men. That's not new, that a god would uh, show up and, and, and appear as a human being. But that's not what the Bible is claiming, that God appeared as a man, that he became one, that he is, was one, that he took on flesh, entered in, not for a time in appearance as a, as a grown glorious man, like some Greek hero, but as a fragile, helpless baby. So it's, it seems ridiculous and risky from a human perspective. But I, I think, honestly, the story of the incarnation is an invitation for us not to see things from a human perspective, to see things from God's perspective, even just for a glimpse. We can read what John says, right? We've seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, what about glory? What do you think of when you hear the word glory? What comes into your mind? The Greek word for glory is doxa. 
It means uh, the significance of. We, we don't think of that. We think of things that are shiny, right? Bright, shiny things are, are glorious. Like, I don't know, I, I can't help it. I think of Clark Griswold when he lit up his house in, 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 the, in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And he said, isn't it glorious? Picture of them, you know, outside. Some of you light up your house and light a little one and get it all just right because it looks glorious to our human perspective. Or, or sometimes in classical paintings of the nativity, Jesus is like, uh, he's glowing, like this image here. Like baby Jesus is a nuclear baby or something. Like he's radiating some, some weird energy coming off of Jesus. We're trying to depict glory, but that's not what the Bible has in mind when it talks about glory. It's not talking about bright, shiny things. The Hebrew word is the word kavod, and it means weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, the heaviness, the significance of who God is, all of who he is. In the Old Testament, if you ever read through the Bible, how do people react when God shows up in his glory? Do they go, sweet, that is cool? Do they? No. They fall down. They hide their face. They fall down. They cower in fear. In fact, there's a story in Exodus, uh, the Old Testament, where Moses and God are having this conversation, and Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, you couldn't handle it. It would kill you. I'll let you catch a glimpse as I pass by. That's all you could handle. And John says, we've seen the fullness of his glory in this baby. The New Testament authors put it this way, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Hebrews 1, 3. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. He's the radiance of the glory of God. The full weight and significance of the God of the universe, if you believe in such a being, present in a helpless human baby. C.S. Lewis writes of this in an essay called The Grand Miracle. The Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. The assertion being that what is beyond all space and time, what is uncreated, eternal, came into nature, into human nature, descended into his own universe, and rose again, bringing all nature and us up with him. The incarnation, flesh and glory, fused together in this baby, in Christ, tells us three things about God. I don't know, um, in a couple weeks, we're gonna make our New Year's resolutions, which probably won't last past March. Spoiler alert (laughs) for most of you. Maybe you'll be the exception. But I mean, of all the things you could pick, if you could know for certain that one year from today, December 23rd, uh, 2024, if you could be certain, 100% guaranteed, that you could be different in one area, what would it be? I want to be thinner, smarter, richer. Oh, that's fine. Taller. (laughs) What would it be? I would just suggest to you that if you could only pick one, it would be in knowledge of who God is. To know him better than you know him now. To really know him. A year from now, to look back and say, I know God better than I ever have before. Well, three things that you can know about God from the incarnation. One, it tells us what God is like. Flesh and glory tell us what God is like. What is God like? Well, God's not an idea. He's not a force. He's not a concept out in the universe. God's not distant or uninvolved in this world that he created. He's so involved he entered into it as one of us. I mean, sometimes we think of God, well, if he exists out there, that he's like the absentee landlord. He made it, and it's his, I guess, but he's not very involved in my life. The incarnation says he's so involved, he became one of us. Suffered like we suffer. In fact, suffered for you. God is not uncaring or unaffected by our sin or suffering. 
He experienced it. He entered into it. God thought it was worth the risk to enter into this world. He involved himself to the point of entering into the creation that he made. We sing the song a minute ago. We sang it. Hark the herald angels sing, right? Do you ever stop and think about these songs? Maybe you just, sometimes I do it too. You go through the motions and you just sing the words because it's Christmas time. It's what you do. But look at these words for a minute. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Think about that when you sing it. What is it saying? This is what God is like. He's not far away. He's not distant. He's not uncaring. He's closer than you can possibly imagine. The second thing, it tells us that we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. What, what after all, is the good news? Miss Becky was teaching the kids up here, right? Angels showing up on a hillside, and they said, don't be afraid, because the angels were afraid, or the shepherds were afraid. Angels said, what? I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A what? A savior. Not in some general, vague sense like, you know, he's gonna make the world a better place, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. A savior to save you. Do you need saving? From your own sin. From your own darkness. It tells us we can be forgiven. We read the Nicene Creed, maybe some of you grew up reciting this. For us and for our salvation, he came down. Jesus says in Matthew 20 that he came to give his life as a ransom for us. A ransom is a payment for a debt you owe that you can't pay. J.I. Packer puts it this way, the Christmas message is there is hope for a ruined humanity, hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory, because at the Father's will, Jesus Christ became poor, was born in a stable, so that 30 years later, he would hang on a cross. It is the most wonderful message the world has ever heard or will ever hear. So the incarnation tells you what God is like. He's close to you. He cares enough to enter into this world, into your world, and that you can be forgiven. That's why he came. And third, it tells us that we're not alone. If the Christmas story is just about a little baby in a manger, you know, and you pack it up like you do in a couple of weeks, unless you're one of those families who leaves your Christmas lights up till like, until Mother's Day, shame on you, right? We pack it up and it's over. If that's all it is, then you're pretty much alone. I mean, if, if, you, if that's all this is to you, a cultural celebration, then we are on our own in this life. And we do the best we can. But the message of Christmas is you're not. This is the name given that we sing about. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Jesus, in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, we see it this way. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And that means God with us. And then this is actually how the whole story of the Bible ends. Where is it all going, do you wonder? Where is it going? Revelation 21 puts it this way. After I heard a loud voice on the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they'll be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. You could make the case that the story of the Bible from beginning to end is the story of God wanting to be with us. And us running away, doing our own thing, turning our back, and God pursuing to the point where he would enter into the world as a fragile human baby and go to a cross to be with you and that you would be with him. I think this is part of the reason at Christmas time we want to be with family. We want to be home, whatever home means to us. We want to be someplace where we're known and loved and it's safe. That's why the songs are about that. That's why all the Hallmark movies are about that, right? There's something in us that wants that. And we have sort of a, a false version of it in our culture. But it's the gospel story. 
The God who made you in his image and who loves you has come so that you can be with him and be truly home. Once again, J.A. Packer says, we talk so glibly about the Christmas spirit, rarely meaning much more by this than feelings of sentimental warmth this time of year. But if the incarnation is true, then the phrase should carry a tremendous weight of meaning for us. It ought to mean the reproducing in a human life the character of the one who for our sake became poor that first Christmas. And the Christmas spirit in this sense should mark every Christian all year round. I love that. The true Christmas spirit is not nostalgia and the smell of Christmas cookies and giving and receiving of presents and overeating and all that. I like that stuff, by the way. But the true meaning of Christmas is that the God who made me came into the world to redeem me and forgive me. His spirit resides in me and that should never leave me. That's our prayer this year. Jesus, our King, that you'd know him, you really know him, what he's like, that you can be forgiven and that you're never alone. Let's pray. Jesus, we confess that we're just sometimes really distracted and in a hurry. And for some of us, perhaps we've had enough pain in our life that we, we doubt this to be true. But this Christmas, this year, Pray that your spirit would impress on our hearts the truth of Emmanuel. That we can know you. We can be forgiven. And we can be with you forever. We thank you, Jesus, for that is why you came. We pray this in your name, our Emmanuel. Amen. I know some of you thought I forgot. We didn't forget. It's our tradition at Christmas Eve to finish by singing Silent Night as we light the room with our candles. Remembering in worship that our King, the King of Heaven, came on that silent night for us and for our salvation. So after I pray, I'm going to light the Christ candle, the last candle left unlit over there. And once I do that, then you can turn your lights on as we sing this together. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the King of Kings, and we give you praise. But you do not stand far off, but you entered into our world on that silent night so long ago. God's blessings in the new year that you would know him. If you don't mind, drop these off. We need them for tomorrow. Now go in the grace and peace and love of the Lord Jesus, who for you came down. Merry Christmas.